Good day, two-wheeled world. Zach here with RevZilla. I'm here with my friend Spurge. This is High Side, Low Side, Season 6, Episode 3. Coming up on the podcast, a hybrid electric motorcycle from Kawasaki, a discussion of what's going on with Suzuki with our friend Lance Oliver, who will stick around for another edition of the Rev Trivia Engine Guessing Game. Then we'll give away a t-shirt, and of course, we'll hear from you, the viewers and listeners. Before we jump into that, over to Spurge with a word from our sponsor, Motul. For those of you that are avid listeners of the podcast, you know that I have a reputation of being a bit of a fanboy for the KTM product. However, I think the KTM product, especially in their dirt bike line, has gotten a bit of a bad reputation as being maintenance intensive. I mean, all you have to do is change the oil once in a while and the bike is good to go. And I want to give a shout out to Motul for making it very easy to change oil because they have products for their entire oil line available in either one liter or four liter containers. So for my small KTM dirt bike, I only need a liter of oil and I can just use one liter and it's perfectly measured out. And for my larger 890 Rally, well, that's where that four liter container really comes into play. So I wanna give a shout out to Motul for making my oil changes easier as well as yours. And as always, they sponsor Zach's favorite podcast, High Side, Low Side. Okie dokie, everybody. You heard it here first. It's Spurgeon doesn't care what kind of KTM you have. As long as you put Motul oil in it, we'll be happy here at High Side, Low Side. Is that right, Spurge? It pretty much sums up my uh, my emotions <laughs> across the board. Right. Um, Okie doke. Welcome, everyone. Um, you may know, if you've listened to High Side, Low Side for any uh, period of time, which we hope you have, that we're often cynical about emerging technologies such as uh, electric motorcycles, hybrid motorcycles. They often come from manufacturers we've never heard of right there's often these startups where you know it's like glass cake and this <laughs> glass cake is the new firm from bosnia and they have a new electric motorcycle and you're like neato <laughs> and then you never see it and it doesn't happen it's called vaporware i'm told anyway the point is what spurgeon i've been saying for a while is can we get a legitimate manufacturer to make uh you know to to to, to put some effort into these emerging technologies we've We've heard about uh, potential um, swappable battery partnerships uh, with the with the jet. Was the Japanese Big Four? Is that right, Spurge, or like some European firms? Maybe Came, it, it's coming out of it's coming out of the the scooter segment in right, in right. Uh, Asia. Right. Anywho, uh, we have exciting news because at uh, Suzuka this summer, Kawasaki actually showed uh, an electric motorcycle and a hybrid motorcycle, which I think isn't exciting so much as the technology exists because we already know about the technology existing glass cake over in Bosnia did it. Um, but, uh, but we haven't seen it in action with a real manufacturer badge on the side. And and this is Kawasaki actually showing an electric motorcycle and a hybrid motorcycle, which I find very exciting. I think, I think the important delineation there is that Zach and I are not, (laughs) we're not, not fans of electric vehicles and oh. frankly some of the ones that we've ridden have been extremely exciting and i think That's the true. one that really comes to to mind topically is the the live wire Absolutely. Um, which is probably the one that we've ridden most recently and yes. it was a major manufacturer support behind it and yes. I, I think what's which is probably one of the reasons that it's good right yeah i mean that's what i think when i ride a live wire i'm like this is really good and yeah. it didn't take it very long to be very good because harley davidson knows how to make motorcycles but I think you know where we get frustrated is is some of the the fly by night you know schemes that sometimes plague or uh, prey on certain people that are willing to you know put down payments or deposits. But anyway, uh, what what I want to talk about very uh, briefly around the the story with Suzuki or with uh, Kawasaki is the fact that one of the main issues with electric vehicles as it pertains to motorcycles is range, right? I think that's the number one concern that always comes up in the conversation because unlike automobiles, which have larger mass and can support and hide larger batteries, motorcycles are inherently smaller and they need to keep weight down. They need to be manageable. So putting a giant honking extra battery on a motorcycle really isn't feasible. So when Kawasaki introduced a hybrid motorcycle design, which is EV and uh, fuel uh, fossil fuel technology, something like that really speaks to me as at least the first step 
in right. making this technology usable, especially when we're talking about the American market. Because, you know, I understand that for a lot of the Asian communities where it might just be a commuting vehicle, you might only be going 15 or 20 miles each day. You know, in America, typically the number one complaint is like, if I buy this motorcycle, I'm limited to only being able to ride it around town. I can't go touring. And I think a, a hybrid would be a great solution for that. Yeah. So uh, there is an article over at Common Tread at RevZilla.com for you to read. There's a video you can watch of these bikes in action. The thing that I think is most intriguing about it, well, two things. One, uh, you can, when when you watch this one video, you can hear the this one motorcycle accelerate down the, the straightaway at Suzuka. And it, you hear it sort of accelerate as an electric bike, right? You hear that sort of electric whine that you get from an electric bike. And then as it starts, it's going maybe 25, 30, 40 miles an hour, you hear the gas engine kick on and start, you know, you hear like a little 300 or 400 CC parallel twin jump to life and start powering the bike as well. If you've driven a or seen a Toyota Prius any time in the last 15 years, which chances are you have um it's the same idea it it it, um, it pushes itself with electric and then the, the engine kicks on um when necessary which is pretty cool and the way that kawasaki has presented this uh is sort of um you know you're you ride down the freeway and you use the gas engine because that's kind of what you need you get into the city it uses the battery and it doesn't use any gas uh and then if you want to ride twisty roads it'll use a combination of both the electric motor and the the gas engine so I, I don't know. I think it, I think it's cool. I I uh, I think that like Spurge said, it's um, it's sort of it's encouraging, if nothing else. I think it'll be really interesting to see the transition between the two between the the motor to the engine, the electronic motor over to the the gasoline engine. Because you know I think about those early steps that Honda made with introducing VTEC, which worked really great in an automobile, um, but there were some right. there were some hiccups when it got yeah. into the motorcycle technology. So I, I'm excited to see what what Kawasaki has in store. Um, as we wrap up the not the news segment for today, Zach. Mm-hmm. Can you give the 60-second synopsis for our listeners who might not know what Suzuka is? And I think this is part of the education that we always try to bring to our high side, low side <laughs> listeners. What and where is Suzuka, Zach? <clears throat> well, kids, Suzuka is a cathedral of global motorsport, really. Formula One, MotoGP, um, World Superbike, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. We've already gotten to the end of my knowledge. The point is, it's a very famous uh, racing circuit in Japan. It was built as a test circuit by Mr. Honda himself. Well, Honda. Um, And that's one of the things that I think is so cool about Suzuka is that it's a figure eight format, right? The track crosses over itself, so it has almost an equal number of rights as it does lefts. And it was because it was built as a test circuit, it very intentionally has, um, you know, long curves and short curves and uh, back and forth and you know shallow curves and hairpins and uh yeah redfish bluefish so on and so <laughs> forth so it's a uh, long straightaway it's got it's got all the things that you need uh to test a vehicle to make sure that it handles well which i think makes it such an interesting uh racing start of course MotoGP doesn't go there anymore after uh, a, a nasty fatal accident in 2000 something something um when dejiro kato lost his life at the japanese gp so it's arguably not quite safe enough for world championship motorcycle racing, but they still do the Suzuka eight hour endurance race, uh, every summer, which often includes world championship level riders, uh, racing the Suzuka eight hour, which is a famous, famous race in Japan and around the world at this point. Um, so I think that's where these bikes were debuted was during that week or weekend of the Suzuka eight hour, uh, so yeah, the quick, quick little. There Suzuka we go. Synopsis. And and what I, what I, what I want to hopefully do is for our our YouTube viewing audience, uh, we'll see if we can get our producer Chase to pull up a map of the racetrack up and, and put it on the screen mm. so you can see it because it's not you know when Zach says figure eight, it's not a traditional just an eight shape. It's a figure eight, but within no, the within the eights, there's a lot of different technical terrain. Uh, yeah, or, it's, or it's a figure eight. Navigate. It's a figure eight, uh, uh, sort of like loosely, but there are whatever, 15 or 18 turns or something like that. Yeah. It's, it's cool. a really, it's, it's a really th- interesting track. And I think, you know, as we think about, you know, uh, these Kawasaki's, it's important to note exactly what we're talking about and how they were tested. And especially considering this was most likely an endurance test, right? This was not just going out and doing one or two laps. They were, you know, putting through their paces. Uh, well, not necessarily. Well, we don't know that from seeing the video or anything. I don't think they, like they didn't race in the, I'm making a the, hypothesis. Suzuki, you know, just to be clear. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was more of a demonstration at the track, and uh, and I don't think that we we you know I assume that that some testing is going on, but I would assume that that's happening at the uh, well, I'm blanking on it. The name of the Kawasaki test track. Don't let me down. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, I think that probably sums up not the news. If I had to guess, please do check out that article at Common Tread. It's uh, pretty interesting. There's some photos and, like I said, a video of seeing that bike run, and um, and it's enough to get uh, to get Spurge and I excited. And I hope I didn't offend any of the uh, Bosnians about their glass cake project. I think they should keep it up. Yeah. So for all of you out there that want turbochargers in your motorcycle. You're not going to get that from us, but you might just get some excitement around a hybrid. <laughs> I know that every See what I did there? Says, I pulled it back to a few seasons ago when yeah, we got into debates that, yeah. about turbos. I think if anyone, if every motorcyclist has always said, if I could just have a Toyota Prius of motorcycles, I would love that. <laughs> All, All right. right. Let's go Let- ahead and kick things off. We need to get Lance Oliver on the, uh, on the podcast, and we have got an excellent show in store for you today. There he is, everybody, the Silver Fox himself, Lance Oliver. Welcome, Lance. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. My pleasure. (laughs) Uh, So we were very tempted, Lance and I, just so you guys know, to talk about uh, MotoGP the whole time because that's where this story came from. This story came from a sort of news item that you may remember from earlier in the summer um, about uh, about Suzuki leaving the MotoGP World Championship, as well as pulling out of the Endurance World Championship um, at the end of the 2022 season. And it's sort of a surprising thing to do on the face of it. Lance wrote an article about, uh, I think, what was it? The title was Winning's Not Enough. Is that right, Lance? Yes. Right, right. So Good memory. So uh, so Suzuki won the 2020 MotoGP Riders Championship with Juan Mir. Uh, An impressive feat, no doubt. And yet... The, the company's leaving the championship and leaving other world championship racing. And it made us realize that there's, that there's lots to talk about here. You know, why would a company that has had success in such a, a, a large global sport be leaving? And what does it mean about the business model? What, where are they trying to make money Suzuki and where does the company see itself going? And of course, where do we speculate the company will go? So that's what this, uh, episode is about and i guess um to sort of start it off lance can you give us a kind of a synopsis of why you feel uh suzuki is leaving MotoGP and what what uh what the company has said and what we know about it so far for those for those of you listening on the podcast i'm I'm formally raising my hand before i let Lance, jump in with that. I want to back up. And for those of you that are listening to the podcast for the first time, or maybe season six is your first season with us, I want you to know who Lance Silver Fox Oliver is. Lance is the managing editor of our online magazine, Common Tread. Lance has been a guest in the podcast numerous times, and he is a fan favorite. Hopefully, he will be a fan favorite for all of you listening today as well. And more importantly, Lance has written about 28 articles on Suzuki in the past, you know, month. So he is, he is our resident expert on all things Suzuki at the moment. So those are the credentials uh, which are put before you, the listening audience, to now trust what he's about to say in response to Zach's question. So, so Lance, make sure you say something really intelligent here. Yeah, well, the pressure's on now. But as usual, <laughs> you have to discount everything Spurgeon says by about 25% to get rid sure. of the, hy- the uh, Spurgeon hyperbole factor, which always must be considered. So, Fair enough, yeah. Uh, but, but anyway, yeah, to, to talk about why Suzuki left MotoGP, I mean, uh, I don't have any moles inside the Suzuki Board of Directors uh, <laughs> meeting room or or any particular great uh, secrets to, to share, but I think it's it's a couple things. It's, first of all, it's a it's a calculus of how much it costs to go to MotoGP racing and and what it's worth. And then the second part of it is that we've seen uh, a sort of a general retrenching uh, by Suzuki in racing, uh, not just in pulling out of MotoGP and World Endurance, but uh, they currently don't have a presence in World Superbike. Um, they scaled back their efforts here in the United States in uh, AMA Superbike, now run by Moto America. You know. Ari recently raced a, 
a Yoshimura Yamaha and just saying Yoshimura Yamaha is something that I'm sure Zach and, and those of us who follow racing, it's just, it just sounds so wrong because Yoshimura Suzuki was for so many years, the, the most coveted seat in domestic superbike racing. And it was the most uh, successful team and all right. of Matt Mladen's championships and right, Ben right. Spees and right up to Tony Elias in the, in the Moto America era. Uh, but uh, Suzuki, basically dropped that relationship and went to uh, Team Hammer a few years ago because, again, I, there's no explanation for it except they're trying to reduce expenses. Right. And the most expensive thing of all is MotoGP. So if you're really trying to say maybe what we're spending on MotoGP is too much for what we're getting for it in terms of exposure and brand advertising and that stuff, that's the obvious place to cut. Can I ask a question for you and for Zach? Um, and, and I think for the listening audience, um, I'm probably – going to come out the first portion of this episode a little bit more like uh, the everyman. I am the person that uh, might follow a MotoGP race or two throughout the season, but I'm not nearly as versed as Zach and Lance. So I'm going to try and ask questions to help uh, the the every man or woman in the audience listening to have a bit of education behind this as well. So we're talking about the expense of MotoGP. Off the top of your heads, Roughly, what does it cost on an annual basis to put together a MotoGP team? Oh, I, I looked this up, but I don't remember the number. <laughs> I didn't write it down. Do you, do you, do you remember, Lance? I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Um, but, you know, it's, it's obviously far more expensive than any other, you know, any other form of racing. And it's not... Are we talking uh, tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands <laughs> of dollars, millions of dollars? I was going to say $10 million. That was That was what... Um, annually? Uh, oh, yeah, for oh, two, uh, for two oh, yeah. riders. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. for sure. I mean, and I mean, you know, there's the it, it, R&D cost. It's yeah, it's 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 I'm sure it's the money's hard to count. I'm sure from the from the standpoint of the manufacturer, the standpoint of anyone. And they but, don't um, want to tell you how much it costs either. Interesting. Right. Well, I think I think, Zach, you know, that's an important note. So for for those of you listening, um, you know, Zach mentioned R&D cost. R&D is research and design. And when we're talking about Moto America, uh, I'm sorry, when we're talking about MotoGP, these are the premier motorcycles. These motorcycles are specifically built for a, 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 a one-use purpose, right? And that is going fast and winning at MotoGP. And, you know, the technology that goes into them might trickle down, but primarily that's that's really proprietary technology for the most part. Is that not correct? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the the... The reason that research and development costs are so heavy is that they are uh, prototype bikes, right? So it's the Formula One of motorcycle racing. If you're if you're not familiar, and uh, and the when they make parts for these bikes, they don't make them on an assembly line. They make them in a lab. Yeah. Um, and so it's uh, and it's very very difficult to keep up with the with the cutting edge because the state I of the art is so advanced. I think the other thing that's helpful in, in maybe in, in, in understanding this, you know, at, at that level, racing is advertising. And there's two forms of advertising out there, basically, just to boil it down. You've got the, the kind of advertising that says this toothpaste will make your teeth 20 percent whiter. So buy it instead of the other one. And then you've got the kind of advertising that is about burnishing the brand, maybe making people want to identify with a certain brand, and maybe feel a little more cooler if they buy this product versus the other. And MotoGP racing is clearly in that latter, latter category. If Fabio Quartararo goes out on a you know, on his MotoGP Yamaha and wins a race, that doesn't in any way tell me anything about how good a, a YZF-R1 is going to be if I walk into my local dealership to buy one. But it, it kind of makes Yamaha look cooler and, and more more successful, and, and right. it, it may it burnishes the brand in that way. And the problem with that is you can't quantify that, so it's it's <laughs> it, it, you can't say how much the dollars or yen value you got out of that so the board of directors sitting over there in in japan is going to look at the expense and they're going to say is it is it really worth it and you know it's it's very arguable it's very subjective and it, it's, it's it's hard to pin down i mean the old saying is sell or went on sunday and sell on monday and i tend to subscribe to the view that uh, our regular common trade contributor Mark Gardner used to say all the time which it's really more about sell on tuesday through saturday so you can go racing on sunday because motorcycle <laughs> people want to go racing and have fun and they just right. pretend that it's really good marketing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, I think the, the bottom line, the takeaway from this section of the discussion is that it is extremely expensive to run and pay for 
a MotoGP team. And what you get out of it is sometimes intangible. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Zach and, just said it in 10 words what I said in but outside, but outside but, of But outside of marketing, no. traditionally, doesn't it trickle? Isn't there te technology that trickles down from racing? Oh, man. This is a whole other thing that I That's would another podcast. love to talk about. <laughs> No, I think that that is that 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 uh, that's a piece of it that I find interesting. Try to remember to bring that back up, Spurge, when we talk about uh, Suzuki model generations and that kind of thing. Right? You writing it down? He's got his pen. Everybody. For those He's of you listening, down. I'm I'm making a note because yeah, the evolution or the 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 quote unquote trickle down technology from MotoGP to bikes that we the people can buy is something that I think is very interesting and um, maybe not as evident in Suzuki as as in other. Um, manufacturers and i think that that's something worth talking about um but yeah so so the to to put a finer point on it also uh i did look up a couple of quotes from suzuki brass uh when this when this uh story broke about leaving MotoGP and uh and world endurance championship um and here, this is a, this is a little pull quote here or or a little a paraphrase sort of the current economic situation is forcing Suzuki to drastically decrease racing related costs. The need to concentrate its effort on the big changes that the automotive world is facing and use all its economical and human resources in developing new technologies. So we'll, we'll come back to that, but it seems pretty clear that, that Suzuki has decided we're going to take the millions of dollars we spend on MotoGP and we are going to re that's what they're saying. Anyway, we're going to reallocate them to other things within the company. What those other things are, we'll we'll, we'll talk about that. But. Yeah, I'm interested to revisit that statement because I, I have some some stuff that I, I pulled and did some research on a little bit. But I, b before we move on from MotoGP and get into you know some of the changes yeah. that we're seeing with the the Jigs for 750, um, so if I'm correct, when did Suzuki? Because Suzuki only like within the last ten years came back into MotoGP after not being in MotoGP. Do we were, yeah, do we know what year they re-entered MotoGP? So I don't know. hopefully Lance is desperately looking it up. <laughs> no, I uh so the I think what happened with Suzuki if memory serves is MotoGP was sort of previously 500 cc GP which instead of uh four cylinder four stroke 1000 cc bikes I'm being pretty generic here they were um they were 500 cc four cylinder two stroke machines and in that era uh the the end the la the final decade of that era which was essentially the 90s um into the into the first couple of years of the 2000s um suzuki was uh was prominent and they won a couple world championships in that time period and when the switch happened to uh four strokes that it they they, they wobbled a little bit is that how you remember it lance I yeah don't think so suzuki's last rider championship in, in that was in 2000 with kenny roberts jr right and then uh the switch to four strokes came and suzuki went away for a while and, and yep. then they came back and i don't remember the exact year so maybe oh seven maybe something I like think that it was, somewhere I, think there, it was, I think it was 2011 based on your article that sounds lance. right yeah, yeah that yeah. sounds right so okay we had that gap there where they were gone for several years and so there was an exact 20 year gap between kenny roberts jr and joan mir winning the the writers championships and so, in some ways that's kind of impressive that 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 yeah. that suzuki came back and, and that they can go away and come back and still still yeah. win and, be and they won they yeah. won some uh, suzuki won some races in there in the in, in the interim of chris vimulin won in france sure. and at some point i if memory serves uh so it's been not meteoric because everyone kind of assumes that suzuki's good at racing but I, maybe the, I'm not sure where you're going with this exactly, Spurge, but it was sort of a you know Suzuki left and then came back to your point and and didn't just come back and and kind of like uh, uh, flop around, uh, right. you know, suffocating. They it, it succeeded as a, yeah. as a as a as a racing company. They didn't leave MotoGP because they sucked at it. They left for other reasons. So <laughs> right. they they were they were successful by any by any measurement. Well, so the, my 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 point here was getting back to what the quote was that you read. Right? It sounds like they're. They're pulling out of uh, MotoGP, and the the kind of reason that they gave was the current economic global climate, and to refocus their efforts in other maybe emerging technologies and or the automotive world. My point in, in raising this was, and this gets kind of you know it speaks to the theme of this episode. This this theme of this episode, folks uh, listening, if you haven't already gathered, is going to be a bit wide reaching, right? And in 2012, uh, one year after 
the Suzuki brand re-entered MotoGP, they pulled cars out of America. And if I had to guess which was a more lucrative investment for them, you know, selling <laughs> cars in America or racing MotoGP, I would have guessed that selling cars in America was more lucrative. Um, and now it seems like almost like they're coming back around and they're saying, we're going to refocus our efforts on the automotive side of things and the emerging technology side of things versus, you know, motorcycle racing. And I don't have anywhere where I was going with that, but just I think it's an interesting <laughs> point to make. And maybe there's some comparison there. Maybe there's some uh coincidence I, I don't know but it just so our audience is aware of the dates there was some alignment with them coming right. back to moto gp and then pulling out of the automotive sphere in america didn't suzuki automotive f- file chapter 11 or chapter they did seven yes. or chapter 11 yeah. i believe it was chapter 11. bankruptcy um yeah so certainly in the past number of years i guess the past 10 years you could say or or maybe 15 years you could say there's been a there's been a retraction of uh i don't know suzuki in 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 the marketplace or at least in the in the sort of sphere of optics of uh of us here in the united states or or in the 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 world is that accurate i I want i don't think it's exactly accurate it depends on how you frame it and i will we'll get into that Later on, I think what's accurate to say at this point in the discussion is that there's been a, a, a real retrenchment in Suzuki's involvement in racing. Right. So, so with well, but that, also, but I mean the car thing too, right? So like, not, yeah, not, it they're depends not on what cars here, and they're not uh, sponsoring a super bike team. That's I mean, more that, of an Ameri- that's, that's more of an that's an American scale thing, yes. right? I know, I know, yeah, I know, yeah. I know. I'm saying that's what I'm saying. I'm saying yeah. in the United yeah. States. So yeah. there, there's that like, and that's that's that affects our. Uh, the the optics that we have right the three of us because we're in the United States market and I know that that's not the whole thing and we, uh, like Lance said we'll touch on that a little later but 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 that's if you if someone said cause somewhat cynically oh I'm mean, Suzuki just they must be going down the toilet they're like they, they you know chapter eleven with cars not selling cars anymore they stopped sponsoring uh, you know a superbike team and now they're and now they're pulling out these world championship things it's all going sideways. If that would be that would be cynical and and not tell the whole story, but it's not wholly inaccurate, right? It's just incredibly incomplete. <laughs> <laughs> Fair it's, enough. So it's a, it's we can, a, we're going to talk a, about that. We're going to talk singular, about that. Later, it's a singular but, view, but I think yeah. at this point in the podcast, if you're listening, that might be what you're thinking, and I think that's Zach's point, right? Like if, sure. if this is yes. if this is the only piece of if this is the first time you're hearing any of this and high side low side is where you get all your breaking news <laughs> uh, you might be thinking to yourself oh suzuki's in trouble now so oh. I, I was going to pivot to, to to you know so we talked about MotoGP, but where are we seeing some changes in suzuki motorcycles being used for other forms of racing and lance i i want to throw this one to you well so when after they pulled out of MotoGP, uh, Suzuki Motors USA issued a statement saying, "Look, we're still going to keep racing in Moto America, road racing in the United States. We're still going to keep racing Supercross and Motocross in the United States. Uh, we're still going to keep racing uh, pro stock drag racing." So they went out and specifically tried to reassure people that they, we're not pulling out of all racing everywhere. Um, so they do still have they 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 did cut their ties with Yoshimura as I met as I mentioned before, but. They just replaced that with a new partner in the terms of Team Hammer, which in Moto America operates as the M4 X Star Suzuki team, and they're fielding both Superbike and Supersport riders. So, you know, there is still a lot of Suzuki racing going on, especially in the United States, actually. And and uh, and Suzuki, sorry to interrupt you, but Suzuki has an off-road presence as well. Suzuki has a, a Supercross team, right? And well, that's why. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They they specifically okay. said we're going to keep racing Supercross, we're going to keep racing motocross, we're going to keep doing and- drag racing. So right. they're not going away, and those are are those factory efforts. I think they are. Are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is yeah. the so, so so pivoting right. to the, the the piece about Hammer, and I know that they've that there's there was a shift to and Lance. I only know this because I read your article, but there was a shift to the the GSX R seven hundred and fifty coming back. Is that a factory yes. effort or is that <clears throat> not a factory effort? Well, it's a it's a it's it's a it's a team supported by Suzuki. So basically team hammer runs the super bike effort for Suzuki in Moto America. And in the super sport class, what happened that is really interesting is that they changed the rules at the uh, international level. Whereas before it was all, you know, 600 CC four cylinders. 
and that was the max displacement was 600 cc so everybody was racing cbr 600 rrs and yamaha r6s and gsx r 600s and so forth and they opened it up so we're they made a bunch of other bikes available so they made the ducati v2 which is 955 cc v twin eligible they made the gsx r750 eligible uh they made the triumph 765 triples eligible and you can still run the 600s and some people do because there's been decades of development that have gone into them well the problem was i mean you look at that and you think wow that that GSX R750 seems like an obvious choice, <laughs> and, and and it is because this the 750 and the 600 have exactly the same chassis, and exactly the same swing arm. So if if, if the if you've been running a GSX R600, why wouldn't you switch to a 750? Right? Seems like a no brainer. Well, the problem was, and I know we're going to talk about this more later with Suzuki not really updating their models much. The 750 was actually still a uh, had a, a cable throttle. It did not have ride by wire throttle. And in order to pa pause comply... for one second for our listeners. So what, what Lance is talking about is that your right hand actually turned back on a throttle that pulled a cable, which went down and opened a butterfly valve, um, way, which allowed way back when Lance was air to come in. Yes. Right. So most motorcycles today, when you pull back on the throttle, the, it triggers a sensor uh, that sends an electronic uh, message through a wire down to a separate computerized uh, mechanism that that mechanism then opens the the, the throttle. You, so what, what you're saying is that the Suzuki was so out of date that it was still <laughs> pulling a wire and that wire was manually opening the throttle body, correct? Exactly. Thanks for that uh, clear and cogent explanation. I'm and just trying to make <laughs> Ari Henning proud. Uh, he would be proud. So because of that, uh, the bike couldn't be made to comply with the rules because they have these balancing regulations to try to make the Ducati V-Twin and the 600cc four cylinders and everybody uh, be equal. Uh, so you have to have a ride-by-wire throttle working with uh, uh, an electronic engine management unit to comply with the rules. So Team Hammer went out and said, we're going to develop a kit to replace all the parts that you need to replace to make this bike eligible. And it was a last minute thresh and they did it. And they're actually now racing. Uh, I think there's four 750s that are now racing in super sport in Moto America. And they have done pretty well. Uh, Tyler Scott, who's a really promising 16 year old kid uh, for the, for team hammer uh, team, I should say, for an XR Suzuki team. Uh, he's already won one race, and uh, the bike is definitely competitive. The thing is, we haven't yet seen anybody use it in World Super Sport, where we we have seen people come in with the Ducati, Triumph, MV Agusta, um, right. and those bikes to challenge the the six hundreds. So, so to to stay on my side of the argument fence here and play the cynical um, jerk who is just trying to tear down Suzuki. This is the state of Suzuki's cutting edge racing that we're going back to using a GSX R750. And that the, a proprietary model, the team, first... a proprietary team is doing the R and D necessary to right. get their motorcycles up to spec to be able to race. Right. So, so in some ways, this is a step forward with the FIM, you know, declaring legality of uh, of a GSX R750 for for next gen uh, Supersport, but. But in some ways, it's just a step backwards to to, to the GSX R750 being the bike that Suzuki races, and and there is no clearer evidence of it being a step backwards than the bike being so antiquated that someone else had to update it. No, I, I would agree with you, Zach, in the sense that it's not exactly a uh, um, you know a really laudatory piece of evidence of Suzuki's commitment to racing. <laughs> <laughs> that, well that, said. Well said. That, that this independent team had to go out and do all this work, uh, but. What I was trying to get to with that is not that this is some great thing that Suzuki is doing, but rather I think it's a really interesting way where uh, we can still we're still going to see Suzuki's uh, competing and perhaps and in, in at least in a spot where they they you know, before people were riding GSX R six hundreds in that class, but as we move away from six hundreds, I think this is a way that um, make, makes the brand. Uh, continue to be relevant in a place where it may not have continued to be relevant before. So, uh, quick question 
before I don't know if this is a this is a weird way to segue, but I think we're we're just about ready to take a break. If, if correct me if I'm wrong, Spurge. Um, but quick sidebar here, Lance. Do you know if a potential Yamaha R9, which would be a Yamaha R sport bike, but it would use the MT09 uh, uh, 890cc three-cylinder engine, would an R9 be legal for next-gen super sport rules? Mm, not I didn't, under the I current didn't see rules. that coming. What a no. curveball of thought. I love it. Well, you got to get a pretty early to keep up with this guy let me tell you <laughs> so i'm just saying provocative gotta... hard-hitting questions is what you get when you subscribe to this podcast <laughs> i love it so you got you got uh you got a 955 cc ducati v-twin you've got a 750 cc inline four from suzuki and you've got a 600 and 765 oh, sorry 765 765 triple. 765 triple from triumph that's legal so i suppose an 890 triple from yamaha it would have to be dumbed down a bit i mean it would have to be dumbed down in the same way that the gsxr 750 is because and if you can do that with a gixxer 750 a gixxer 750 is a lot more has a lot more potential horsepower wise than a 765 sure. triumph and, so they, and, they they're they're already creating parity to a certain extent so right. why not an r9 it they could potentially decide to let that in i mean it's not obviously currently under the current rules but they could well, i suppose decide to do that and to, it's, to not even, point, it's not even a model that exists, right? To be clear, it, to until it exists, and, and <laughs> but right. it's not an issue. But uh, the the interesting thing to your point about the GSX R750 is, I you know I talked to them about uh, how they have that bike tuned under the existing rules, mm -hmm. and so the the Super Sport race bike in Moto America it makes the same peak power as the GSX R600 because right. of the balancing regulations, mm -hmm. but because of its bigger size, it has better torque, right? And the racers say they love it because, yeah, you know, their their top speed down the straight is no better, but their torque coming for getting off the corners is better. So they love it. Who yeah. doesn't Who doesn't love big torque? Who doesn't love <laughs> torque? Yeah. All right. Well, with with that bombshell, that <laughs> torque is good. Uh, let's uh, take a break, shall we, fellas, and hear a quick word from our sponsor, Motul. Okay, so we have done a good job of covering some of what's topical as far as Suzuki pulling out of racing. We've painted a picture for you, the listening audience, uh, about really what's happening in the world of two-wheeled hyper sports. But now we want to bring it back. We want to bring it back to a bit more of, uh, of a, a tangible you know, topic for the majority of us listening because most of us aren't going out and racing uh, at a MotoGP level. Um, but we do want to talk about what's happening with Suzuki for the consumer. You know, when you walk into your local dealership and you see what motorcycles are on the floor, what motorcycles aren't on the floor, a lot of that, you know, goes back up to the company as a whole. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, the R&D that goes into uh, racing and the trickle-down effects that are sometimes seen. And, you know, that's the other reason outside of marketing is that, you know, racing at a premier level gives these manufacturers a place to test out some of this technology. And then we all benefit from that technology with the bikes that we buy. But really, why don't we see Suzuki releasing new motorcycle models in the U.S.? We've, we've talked about this before, for what it's worth. The, those of you who have... Uh, you know, our loyal high side, low side listeners, you've, you've heard us bring this up on a couple of occasions. And this is one of the reasons why when the whole um, Suzuki pulling out of MotoGP came up, we thought, well, there's lots of other stuff to talk about. So, so w I, I think Spurgeon, you did some research here and I'm curious. I don't think Lance was, was part of this conversation earlier. You, I think you determined, or you have a you let's, have ask, a date. let's ask Lance what he thinks before okay, we okay. give it away. So yeah, Lance, what do you, what do you think the first, according to Spurgeon Dunbar's research, um, <laughs> what do you think the last model was that Suzuki released that was all new? What year did it occur? Oh. And we're not just doing like updates. Like when they yeah, took yeah. the V-Strum and they added an extra 50 cc's magically to the name, <laughs> that doesn't count. Right. So when the V-Strom went from a V-Strom 1000 to a V-Strom 1050, that doesn't count because it, the engine was the same. And so updates don't count. All new model, completely fresh. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've stumped me. Oh, but well, well, if you go back far enough, you can, you can, you can think of some, right? Uh, I mean, I guess, uh, uh, 
well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> have to go back. You actually don't have far. a guess. Yeah, you I, have to go back I, pretty far. I, so go, I, keep going. Go back as go go back too far. Let's start there. What's the what's what's a what's a brand new fresh uh, clean sheet design Suzuki that you remember coming out at any point during your life? Well, I mean, you know, the the SV650 came out and it was such a big success. So then they came out with the thousand, which has been had m- numerous permutation since then but that right, was right. yeah that's been way back so right oh, so you're, well, when the uh, uh, time out you're, so you're in you're in the right you're in the right ballpark there so technically so, uh, from the research that i've done though the thousand <laughs> came out first with the tl 1000 which yeah but is, is that's not really the same bike the tl 1000 is yeah. their 90 degree v-twin yeah. engine, which was which was the foundation for what became the larger v-strom engine yeah, but this is it's not a new bike if it has the same engine but a totally different everything else. So I'll give no, you no. the S I'll give you the SV650, but my point is, is the SV650 came out came out 99 99 and then the TL1000 okay. came out in uh 98. And for those and then, of you listening, the TL1000 is a Suzuki sport bike that they manufactured with a, uh, a a 90 degree V twin engine, and Lance is referring to the SV650, which is a small well, naked sport bike. I was uh, actually referring to the V Strom Thousand, which came out after the 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 650. Okay, okay, right. You're you're talking about the V Strom 1000. Yeah. I think Spurge is right though, because the TL1000 there was a TL1000S and there was a TL1000R, and and that engine is. Still, as far as I know, what's in the V-Strom 1050, which is not, what Suzuki's not known for. Not literally the no, same but, engine, but, 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 it's, but that's what Suzuki's known for, right? And that's what we're trying to get to right. the bottom of. Like the Suzuki yeah. V-Strom 1000 was not an all-new model. They took an existing engine and they built uh, a bike around it. So, so full clean sheet design, right? I mean, to be fair to Suzuki, this doesn't happen all the time. This doesn't happen all the time. This is, this is, uh, you know, somewhat rare, right? That 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 a bike is really truly all new. Like you know, Yamaha came out with the MT09. That was a, or I guess it was, it was the FZ09 at the at the time, and now now MT09. But that was a an all new bike, right? We can agree on that. It was it was it was yeah. totally new. Sure. Um, but often, you know, uh, brands often do this. You know, uh, Ducati will come out with a new. Uh, you know, monster, a new hyper motard, but it's the engine that they use and the other thing, or, you know, the Ducati super sport came out and that was the first time a super sport had come out in a long time. But really the, the super sport engine was the same engine they had used in the hyper and the monster at that point, I think, or maybe yeah. I have it the other way around. The point is it's not, we're, we're not, we're not picking on Suzuki, you know, because this is completely unheard of. Well, it's I want to hear it's the, the timeline is, is pretty long. Yeah, so I want to hear the result, the fruits of Spurgeon's research here. But... <laughs> well, you might have shot some of it out of the water. <laughs> no, no. So from what I, from what I've been able to do the research on the, so the Suzuki V Strom was actually one that I was thinking of. the The V Strom 1000 came first, and it was it came first because it was it utilized the 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 1000 engine. The 650, this, the V Strom 650 came later, and that took the SV650 engine. So then I went back and I was like, okay, well the SV650 obviously uh, was out before those bikes. So the SV650 was introduced, uh, the first gen came out in 99 and the TL1000 came out in 98. So I was like, bingo, there we go. It's got to be the TL1000. However, the, yeah, that would be it. Yeah, because the, no, yep. When did the, the Gixxer 1000, I was wrong. The Gixxer 1000 was, 2001 when it replaced the Gixxer 1100 and so if my math is correct <laughs> that yes yeah, so so the the last time uh, a model was introduced that was all new would have been the the Gixxer 1000 in 2001 because the the V-Strums were based off of previous engines uh that were that had already existed so According to my loose mental math here, and it's getting a bit fuzzy as I'm talking about it, it would be either a Gixxer 1000, which was introduced in 2001, or if you want to argue that the uh, the V-Strom doesn't count because it carried over, I was negating the V-Strom because it carried over an existing engine model that was introduced in 98. If we're saying we're not counting that, 
Then it would have been the Suzuki V-Strom, uh, which was introduced in 2002, which was one year after the, we got the new Gixxer 1000. This is the V-Strom 1000? The V-Strom 1000. Or did the 1000, 650 come out first? The, the 650 came out later from what I'm from what I've been able to research for what it's worth. So approximately 20 years. Yeah, like we're splitting hairs here, right? right. Like whether it was a, a Suzuki V-Strom 1000 or 650 or the Gixxer 1000, and there's been updates on these models since then, but, you know, a complete ground up new motorcycle, it's been about 20 years since we've seen one from Suzuki. And this, our, our research is less... Uh, comprehensive we will raise our hands and admit in the um cruiser space and in the off-road space so like i feel like it's possible that they did a clean sheet uh we might have missed we might have missed a boulevard or we might have missed you know something along those lines but right right and, and to your point that you made earlier zach like this isn't something that happens all the time like you know if you're looking at like the triumph tiger for example you could argue that the Tiger 900 wasn't an all-new model released three or four years ago, that it was just, you know, based on the Tiger 800. And then I would tell you that you're wrong because the Tiger <laughs> 900 is a completely different engine. But we're splitting hairs here. Like, we are we are trying to just do some research onto, like, really the heritage of Suzuki. And it's been a while since we've seen something that's not just a, a redesign of an existing platform with different clothing on top so, of it. So, so... Uh my question, and 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 to well, I guess we don't, yeah, we don't need to worry about that. My question to the team here is: Is that a problem? Is 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 that so bad that that Suzuki has reused the um, the 750 cc inline four on uh, from the GSXR 750 of 15 years ago or something like that in the you know GSXS 750, or they've used the 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 GSX uh, our 1000 engine from 2005 in so many models now in the, um, in the GSXS 1000, uh, the Gixxus 1000 F, the, the new GSXS 1000 GT plus it's all the you know, same, same engine from years and years ago. Let's see how long He's... you can keep doing this for. <laughs> I might be, I might be out at this point. I'm not sure. Um, and the GSXR 1000, engine itself did get a revamp in 2017 with the variable valve timing and you know so that was kind of sexy uh, but yeah, realistically nothing turns me on more than variable valve time yeah mm. i gotta you gotta mm. you gotta, mm. you gotta, you gotta hubba, say hubba. that but is it so bad is this such a bad thing why not just use engines if they work well and and lance has ridden a gsxs 1000 gt plus one of suzuki's more recent uh models and it's quite a good motorcycle in my opinion lance would you agree so what's wrong with using old engines yeah, I mean, I think that's uh, that that particular bike is a great example. And and when you ask, is this a bad thing? And I would say, is it a bad thing for who? You know, who is it a bad thing for the consumer? Is it a bad thing for the company or whatever? But it's obviously not a bad thing for the company. They can just keep reusing engines until the end of time. Is it a bad thing for consumers? Yeah. Is it bad for it, us? Is it bad for I the mean, industry? Does it look? Is it is it bad for optics? I don't really care. I mean, I just want to. I just want good <laughs> motorcycles if they work. And the the the, the GSX S one thousand. GT Plus is a great example because you're right. It's the same engine that we see date back to the 2005 GSXR 1000 uh, that you guys have ridden in various guises and made videos about. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it works. It's been updated, retuned to be put into uh, a, a, new, a new sport touring bike. And the result is you have uh, a really good a really good sport touring bike for under $14,000. It comes with you know, locking hard luggage and all the basics that you need. So, and it's, great, great it's, bike. Yeah. it's just as powerful, just as light as its main competitors. And it's cheaper than anything from the European makers. Mm -hmm. And so, I, so sounds gonna, good to me. I'm going to, yeah, same question, same question to you, Spurge. I'm going to argue. So Zach made the comment a few minutes ago about like, <laughs> obviously it's good for the, the manufacturer, maybe Lance said it. I think it was Zach though. They said obviously it's good for the manufacturer because you know they they produce one engine and it cuts down on R and D costs. I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree. I think that this is bad for Suzuki, and here's why: because they're not creating any new interest, right? And and when you look at what Honda has done with the Grom, and you look at Kawasaki answering with the Z125 and introducing a whole new youth market, and you look at Triumph with 
revamping their Bonneville line to be more nimble and smaller and, and, and speak to a younger audience. You look at what Ducati has done, what KTM has done, and the constant evolution keeps eyeballs on their brand, and those eyeballs translate into sales. And I think when you look at what Suzuki has done, they've they've lost their their entry level edge. They've lost the excitement around you know new models. And for the longest time, and I'm going anecdotally back to when I was working at a dealership, you know we we had a lot of the other you know big four Japanese brands, and people would come in and say, I want to I want a Jixer. And the 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 term Jixer was you know synonymous with sport bikes. So people came in and they didn't say they wanted a sport bike, they wanted a Jixer. And as you've seen the fall off of sales from the sports segment, Suzuki's not coming back with anything new or exciting or interesting to to be competitive in that place. And then and then you look at the expansion <laughs> of the adventure market and you look at the innovation of bikes introduced in the past 10 years, whether that's an Africa Twin or a Tenere 700 or a Touring, and that doesn't even touch the surface of getting into the KTM brand, which we'll just put a pause <laughs> on because I don't want to get too long-winded here. But they're, they're not staying competitive with the segments that are more popular right now, and that, in turn, is not translating to new sales. So I don't think this is a good thing for the brand. Right. Right, and that's that's a little bit of devil's advocacy, but that's also a little bit of how I feel. How about you, so, Zach? Well, so so this is what I wanted to bring up with regard to MotoGP because I think this is interesting. So, quick, very quick, I'll I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, history lesson here, um, and Lance, you'll have to confirm. I'm pulling this out of my out of my <clears throat> out of the backside of my brain. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, but in 2003. 2003, 2004, it was January 2004, perhaps December 2003, Yamaha went to the MotoGP test in Sepang, Malaysia, and their bike sounded totally different. They had had an inline four in the, in the YZR-M1 up to that point, and at that point, they took out a bike with their new rider, Valentino Rossi, and he rode around, and that bike sounded weird. It had a cross-plane crankshaft, inline four, and it sounded all funky. That was uh, Malaysia 2004, I believe. In 2009, Yamaha came out with an R1 that had that cross-plane crank. Ben Spees went on to win uh, World Superbike Championships. Uh, it evolved into the, the R1. It, it, that's the embodiment of the R1 at this point. Um, and uh, the, the Yamaha MotoGP program was super successful with it. The Yamaha World Superbike program was super successful with it. And the the aura of that bike, I think... Um, they sold is, a ton of them. They sold a ton of them. Because of they, them. Because they, they sound great and they work well. In 2014, I just looked this up, so so bear with me. We can put a little correction on the screen if I'm totally wrong about this. Um, but in 2014, Suzuki replaced their four-cylinder v, uh, V4 GSVR uh MotoGP bike with the GSX RR which is a cross plane inline 4 it's a it's a diff, it's a Suzuki version of the Yamaha cross plane crank Suzuki is doing they've followed this path of of engineering and they won a MotoGP world championship with the bike and we don't see any of this trickle down technology in the street market at all we don't see it in the GSXR 1000. We don't see it in the GSXS 1000 GT Plus, which we agree is a good motorcycle. But would it not be more exciting if that kind of stuff came from MotoGP and made its way into uh, into the street market, into the consumer market? I'm not saying that would unlock some, you know, vast uh, I don't know <laughs> the riches of of revenue for Suzuki, but. To Spurgeon's point, it would be good for optics, right? And and would it not create exciting bikes? Is that uh, is am, am I am I being too cynical about Suzuki that they've developed this thing in MotoGP and then now they're going to pull out of MotoGP and they're never going to deliver any of that to the consumer when there's a there's a precedent for that working, pretty obviously. Lance. Anybody? <laughs> Lance, no, I'm, not, I'm I'm giving the, I'm going to let Lance go. <sighs> 
Uh, or is I'm, my reasoning just so solid that you can't even poke a hole in it? It's watertight. No, the, the problem I have is that <laughs> I feel like we, we left the key discussion for last. And, and, and that's where all of my answers to your question kind of want to deal on things we haven't talked about yet. We're just, we're keeping people on the hook. When we get so, to the end, boy, <laughs> everybody, you are going to think I am so enlightened. I, I just, I, I feel like everything we're talking about has to do with the U.S. market. And I think everything that Suzuki is doing makes sense when you stop thinking about the U.S. market and start thinking about the world. I think okay. this is a, I think this is a great pivot. Spurgeon? I think Lance you should take us into the pivot and explain your well, statement. Well, I didn't, I didn't want to get off track here because I no, know No, 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 you're not off track at okay. all. Let's here, I'll explain. I'll take us off track. I'm changing the track. I'm switching the tracks. <laughs> Does okay, so, d- w- so enough already about how Suzuki is serving me, the middle class American white guy. Well, Good point, be- Lance. How does uh, how does Suzuki's strategy play into the rest of the world? And does Suzuki even need the U.S. market? Well, th- this goes to your question because the if if you're going to trickle down that particular MotoGP, you know, technology, it's going to go to expensive, fast motorcycles that are sold basically in the United States, Europe. You know, not not the whole world, not the big motorcycle markets of the world. So, right. That's why I think it's you know, we we need to look at the bigger picture. So I, I went back and you know I, I wrote an article uh, some time ago. One of the ones that Spurgeon claimed was hundreds of articles that I wrote uh, <laughs> about how Suzuki is not really a motorcycle company, which got a lot of discussion on Common Tread. Uh, but since I wrote that, they've come out. The Suzuki has come out with their uh, latest quarterly financial report. So I've got updated information to. Since I wrote that article, there's uh, newer information to go on. So wait, wait, pause and tell our audience the gist of what that article was. The the, art, the point of that article was to say, in in the United States, we naturally think of Suzuki, you know, especially people my age. Oh, they're one of the big four Japanese. They're they're a motorcycle company. And what I found when you start looking beneath the surface is, they they sell uh, their sales of cars amounts to 12.6 times as much as their global sales of motorcycles. They sell more. In dollar terms, they sell more marine engines than motorcycles and ATVs combined in the United States. So what I'm saying is, this is a much broader company than a motorcycle company. Right. And so we are, you know, we're coming at it with what I feel like is double blinders on. We're we're looking at it from the U.S. perspective because that's where we are, and we're looking at it as high side from a high side low side perspective, which is motorcycles. So we're kind of ignoring 90% of Suzuki's business because we're all we're talking about is motorcycles in the United States. And, and that's really not what Suzuki is about at all. It's a much bigger company. So looking at their, their most recent uh, financial report for the first quarter of fiscal year 2022, um, they actually had net sales of 1 trillion 63 billion yen, which is an all-time record for Suzuki. So they sold more stuff last quarter than they've ever sold in history. It sounds like uh, it sounds like your your freelance salary that you bill that you bill back the company. Trillions of yen. Whew, <laughs> trillions of so many yen. So many yen. And global motorcycle sales were up fifty point one percent over twenty twenty one. Wait, say that one more time. They're up what? Global motorcycle sales for Suzuki was up fifty point one percent. Fifty percent. Five zero. Fifty percent. Fifty. Yes. And to go back and get a pre-pandemic baseline, because obviously things have been really weird the last couple of years, but I went back to 2019 and their first quarter sales in 2019 compared to this year, this year's sales were up 31.6%. So Suzuki is selling a boatload of everything. They're selling a boatload of motorcycles. They're selling motorcycles all over the world. They're selling marine engines to us Americans faster than they're selling motorcycles and ATVs. And and all we're talking about is how, oh, gee, Suzuki's in trouble because they haven't, you know, brought out a new cross-plane Jixer 1000. Well, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, we're really not that important, folks. I'm sorry. The United <laughs> States market is just not what Suzuki's about. Right. So does so, it make sense for them to be in MotoGP? Does it make sense for them to be putting a bunch of money into R&D for models for a market in the United States, which is stagnant, not growing? It's expensive to develop new models because they have to be, you know, you're not going to win a big chunk of the U.S. market by coming out with a new 125cc scooter like you can in Indonesia or India or someplace. Right. So you have to spend a lot of money to compete in a stagnant market with tons of companies. So, I don't think it really makes sense. So here's, yeah. so, here, so the, the twist of this podcast then 
is that it's really not about Suzuki. It's about is the American motorcycle market insignificant and should we even exist? Maybe high solos <laughs> needs to go away. <laughs> well, so this this is a, the point that I wanted to bring up. You know, you said, Lance, you were talking about just producing expensive bikes for the first world and uh, that won't work. But that's what Ducati does, right? That's mm-hmm. that's Ducati's business. But that's their whole thing. They make right. they make expensive, fancy bikes, and that's the thing that we can often gravitate to uh, um, as the you know from from our standpoint in in the market and in the global economy. Because for a company like Ducati, the United States market is important. It, it's right. it's yeah. crucial. Um, I mean, I think I don't remember the statistics exactly off the top of my head, but I think the the mark the California market for Ducati is one of the biggest in the world, just right. California, no. because there's, there's year round riding and there's lots of money and that's important, but it's so interesting to think about Suzuki in a different light. As you say, Lance, is this, could, could Suzuki just be, you know, pivoting away from what we think of it? You know, maybe there's some people that think it will be a, it'll be a complete shame if Suzuki isn't, a contender even isn't even a real thing in the U S market in a, in a number of decades. But I guess what, what do you guys think about that? Would, would it be, would it be better to watch Suzuki struggle to try to be a cutting edge, uh, a first world motorcycle company, or would it be better to have Suzuki pivot into something else and, and have it and have the name live on, even if we don't get our, our fancy Jixers and, and that kind of thing in the future. I just, I just think if you're, if you're a member of the Suzuki board of directors and you're looking at this and saying, okay, <laughs> we just set record global sales. And meanwhile, the U S the North America, not U S North America, cause they don't break it down by country, North right. America sales of motorcycles and ATVs combined, uh, for Suzuki amounted to one less than 1.5% of their total sales. So I think it's, if you're sitting there looking at that, it's like, why are we going to invest a ton of money? Right. In a stagnant market, that's less right. than one and a half percent of our our income. So uh, it's, I just don't see it happening. You know, I, right. they can. That's why they keep selling the same stuff they've already got. Because why not? You know, you've got it. Keep selling it. Keep right. finding a new use for that two thousand five Jixer engine, and you know, <laughs> sell what you got. But you're not going right. to invest a bunch of money to try to expand. Right. So well, it's it's sort of back to the whole: is it so bad? And it turns out Spurgeon's wrong. No. As usual. So hold. <laughs> <Zach>. <laughs> How dare you? Anyway, um, Zach's commentary about my right or wrong aside. Uh, <laughs> what I do want to say is, you know, so you're talk. We're talking now. We've pivoted to like, does the United States, you know, market even matter? Uh, here is a global company that's only worried about selling things. They don't necessarily care about what those things are, as long as they're bringing in money and you know increasing profits. And that's just you know economies in general, right? Like that's that's the way businesses win, but. After Suzuki announced that they were pulling out of MotoGP, Suzuki North America then came back and they made a comment and Lance wrote another article (laughs) called Suzuki Issues Statement Reaffirming Its Commitment to the U.S. Motorcycle Market. So again, (laughs) when I talk about Lance writing a lot of articles about Suzuki over the past 27 days, it's been uh, prolific to say the least. Um, (laughs) But you talked about that they came back and they said, you know, the statement issue says, we are committed to the power sports market in the United States um, for motorcycles, ATVs, and scooters. The other piece of this, too, and this gets back into, Lance, before we brought you on, Zach and I were talking about Kawasaki testing hybrids uh, at Suzuka um, and, and, you know, what that could possibly mean for a hybrid motorcycle. But, you know, the company, Suzuki North America, did come out and say that, really what they're trying to do was to it's been made the decision has been made the decision to leave moto gp has been made in light of the changing market environment and it's part of a strategy to allocate resources to ensure the health and vibrancy of suzuki's overall business particularly in the areas of sustainability carbon neutrality and alternative fuel technologies so do we think what we're doing here is Suzuki is saying, you know what? Racing motorcycles that burn gasoline <laughs> does not matter. It might it might still matter now, but it's not going to matter 20 years from now. And so what we're going to do 
is we're going to take that money and we're going to think about where the industry is going, where motorcycling is going. And we're going to reallocate that money into electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, and maybe they come back and surprise us all with a race bike that is EV powered. Do we think that that might be the approach where they're going to save this money from, you know, racing on a global market? They're recognizing that sport bike segments aren't growing. So do we really need to put all this R&D into street racing? Or should we take that R&D? Should we think about where the market is now? Adventure bikes, EV bikes, hybrids, scooters, and put that allocation into developing those products? Well, you, I think it could be that we will look back and think, wow, Suzuki is the smartest company we've ever seen. Look at how they pivoted when they needed to. But I would take it a step further, Spurge, um, in this discussion of what's next for Suzuki, which, um, as you said, some of it has to do, some of it is sort of uh, easily um, understandable because there's there are quotes that say, um, you know, we are going to, quote, redirect technological capabilities um, uh, through racing activities to, uh, you know, initiatives around sustainability and stuff like that. You can pretty easily read into that and think, okay, I get where they're going with that. I think, you know, to, to Lance's point, if you can sell cars, EV or otherwise in India, why even bother with an adventure bike or an electric race bike at all? Well, I think that's there's a branding exercise there, right? And that goes back to Lance's first point about marketing and MotoGP. Like, right. there is a branding exercise of putting your name on a big, flashy, high-end product. And whether whether you can uh, account for that and you can you can actually chalk it up, which we know we can't. You know, you, you can stick a billboard up on the highway, and I don't know <laughs> how many Coca-Colas get sold because I see a little polar bear on Christmas time <laughs> with Santa Claus, you know, drinking a uh, Coca-Cola product, but they still advertise, right? Because it's about impressions. And I think when you're thinking about those flashy flagship models, whether it's an adventure bike or a race bike, you know, I, I think that that aspect of marketing and of branding, you know, still plays a role. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Suzuki says, you know what, we, we really don't, we're not going to worry about that anymore. We're going to change our or whole brand philosophy, but you know, for me, when I think about premier, uh, premier motorcycling, you know, I just think that the 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 winds have shifted, and you know, now it's about, you know, flagship adventure models and flagship EV products, and like that's the buzzword. Everybody's we, we talked about that earlier. Everybody's trying to come out with an electric vehicle, and now we're starting to see a shift where some of the larger OEMs are are you know fighting for that. I'm a little surprised, honestly, that you know, we keep getting hints and suggestions that the, the big Japanese motorcycle manufacturers are going to do something just any day now, you know, in, in the electric <laughs> right vehicle around, realm. Right around the corner. It's just always been right around the corner. <laughs> uh, and, and we really haven't seen nearly as much as I thought from them. And, and they've, it feels to me like they've, they've, Maybe they're being just too conservative or whatever, but it feels like they've kind of ceded the first mover advantage to all of these startups and smaller companies and and European companies and so forth. Um, and and that surprises me a little bit because it seems like they would they would have the the expertise and the and the the depth of experience and and talent to to jump in there and really do something. And we hear things about, oh, yeah, there's there's a consortium of the Japanese manufacturers to work on swappable batteries and all of these different kind of things that might really um, lead to a step forward. But what have we actually seen hit the market? Almost nothing. Uh, and that surprises me a little bit. I don't know. Yeah. You know, Suzuki seems to be suggesting here that that's going to change, but um, I think it's overdue. Perhaps Suzuki will join the Moto E World Championship, which travels with MotoGP and races electric motorcycle. I know, I know what you're going to yeah. say, Lance. I'll give you a second to say it. But <laughs> is you know, is is uh, I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. The, what Lance was going to say, just to, to cut myself off, <laughs> is that Ducati signed a contract to to be the spec provider for uh, Moto E. That's correct, right, Lance? Yeah. So Suzuki probably doesn't want to race a Ducati in the Moto E series. That <laughs> probably might not. might not look good. But it's interesting, I think, 
I don't, I don't really know what this says, but I find it interesting that Ducati will provide electric super bikes basically to race electric high performance sport bikes to race alongside, uh, you know, as a support series for the MotoGP world championship, um, uh, as a sort of, I don't know, a, a signifier, or at least a sort of, a they're waving a flag and saying, we're interested in this. And interestingly, Suzuki pulls out of MotoGP entirely and says it's focusing on, you know, efforts around sustainability and those technologies. It occurs to me that, that one of the best ways to learn about how capable batteries are and what you can get away with is to race a bike to, you know, that that's one of the things that racing has done historically. Like I explained about Yamaha with the, with the M one and the new crankshaft design and blah, blah, blah. You know, electric bikes don't have crankshafts, but obviously something like that could be valuable potentially, right? Something, some, you know, experimenting with the capabilities of your R and D department of your engineering might by racing or competing in some way with an electric vehicle could lead to, you know, further knowledge, future products that could be released to the public. And interestingly, Ducati is the one that's sort of waving that flag now. Maybe it's just a flag waving exercise or, or maybe Ducati's got something up its sleeve. I don't know. I, I, I just think it's, I just think it's curious that the, that we talk, we did all, we all did all this setup for Suzuki leaving MotoGP and like, well, actually they're going to focus on all this sustainability. But, but like we, you said, Lance, we haven't seen anything. Right. I, about I that thought yet. 10 years ago, if you had asked me what we would be talking about now, I would have expected we'd see some real products in the hands of consumers from the Japanese manufacturers in terms of right. uh, alternative fuels or EVs or something, but we just haven't really, haven't seen it. Another, well, think, uh, go ahead, Serge. I was just going to say, you know, well, why don't you go? Why don't you go first? Because my 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 last statement here kind of rounds it out. Okay, I, uh, maybe mine does too. I don't. I don't think it does. It's it's sort of, sort of it's a it's a non sequitur. It's a it's a tangential thing that I found interesting while doing this research on um, on brands that are involved in MotoGP, right? Because there are some pretty obvious brands that are missing, soon to be Suzuki, um, Kawasaki. Um, and then of course, you know, BMW, everyone's always saying, like, why doesn't BMW make a MotoGP bike? Like BMW has all these resources and all this money. And, you know, they had a formula one team and, you know, BMW could make a good MotoGP bike and presumably they could, or the company could, if it, if it, you know, gave it the old college try. But the article I read was interesting in so much that it pointed out that BMW sponsors MotoGP by being the official safety car. So there are BMW cars all over the place and there's BMW branding and then Triumph isn't actually involved in MotoGP. They don't, Triumph doesn't have a MotoGP bike, but Triumph is the spec engine for the intermediate category Moto2. So every single Moto2 bike has a Triumph 765 engine in it. Um, and these are, uh, I think, interesting because it, it arguably they are tactics for Triumph and BMW to involve themselves with MotoGP and be present on a world championship stage without spending the millions and millions of dollars that other companies do to try to create a competitive machine. Just a, just a note that I, well, I mean, that, that, that it's be, I think it speaks volumes to the fact that, you know, MotoGP is still important for the motorcycling audience because otherwise yeah. they wouldn't have gone through the effort. I mean, Triumph went through a big effort to get that, that motor in there and, yep. you know, BMW obviously spending the branding and having their cars, the pace car is no small effort on their part. So yeah. It's back to the branding of what we're talking about. And and just to just to round out that thought, to Lance's point earlier, you know the optics of having a bike, you know the 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 sort of marketing benefit right of having a bike in MotoGP. It's easy for us here in the United States to think, oh well, you know, like oh why don't they just like take the MotoGP engine and put it in a bike that we can ride like Yamaha did with the MT10 or whatever, you know, like wouldn't that be cool? And maybe it would be, but let's not forget that. MotoGP has a massive impact in places like uh, Indonesia and Thailand um, and places where these high-end, expensive, heavy, gas-guzzling bikes don't sell particularly well. But what do sell well are all the... Uh, the 125 every, versions with exactly, the same yes, everything exactly. else. Or, you know, scooters yeah. or little motorcycles or whatever it is. So so to your point, Spurt, to your, the point you just made, being involved with that has value no matter what, right? It has to. So, yeah. 
I don't know where I'm going with that. I'm trying to, I'm, I, I think it's so interesting. And I like the arc of this conversation of starting with this sort of, you know, a uh, uh, very cynical view of what's going on at Suzuki and then pulling it around to all the statistics that Lance presented about how Suzuki is furthering its own cause and succeeding in ways that we don't often see or talk about, aside from the very uh, good articles that Mr. Lance is writing over at Common Tread. Um, but it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to even break away from my own mindset, right? To, to you know, because I think that's a valid point. You go, the 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 marketing benefit of being involved in MotoGP is huge in places other than the United States. And then I come back around to thinking, like, well, why, why isn't a company like Suzuki involved? And if they're focusing on other aspects of the the company, but I, I may, I'm, I'm just missing the point. I, I can't help but miss the point. Sorry, guys. No, Lance, is there anything that you wanted to jump in there before I do? No, go ahead, Spurge. No, so uh, again, Zach, I, I think I think we're all kind of dancing around this, and, and like you said, the arc of the conversation has been good. I want to bring it back around. So we started talking about racing. Um, we then we haven't talked, talked about, about KTMs enough, have we? You're going to bring it back around to KTM? I actually, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm almost I'm almost disappointed that you beat me to it. But the, the the podcasting audience should know by now that I I know where my bread is buttered, and uh, it's, it's on from, the a, it's side. from it's from a, yeah it's from a giant orange manufacturer that has no love for me whatsoever. Um, so let's go uh, and bring it back around because I'm gonna I'm gonna reference you know another one of Lance's articles. But we talked about Suzuki motorcycle racing. We talked about you know why we haven't seen any new models released in the U.S. We talked about the fact that frankly that's probably not that important. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn because they're selling a ton of other products. They're selling marine engines and they're selling scooters and they're selling all kinds of stuff for the entire global market and their sales have been booming. So what's next for Suzuki specifically as it relates to the United States market? You know, Lance, you said a minute ago, if you would have, if we would go back 10 years in time, one of the big four probably would have been, you know, pushing the envelope of EV and and that technology as it relates to motorcycling. And 10 years ago, when we talked about the big four in Japanese manufacturing, we were talking about Suzuki and Kawasaki and Yamaha and Honda, right? Because those four manufacturers had such a huge presence, not on the world, not only on the world, but also in United States sales. And one of the key points that you made is I think oftentimes we look at this lens historically and we say oh the big four as they still exist you know these are the four manufacturers that are still selling motorcycles in the united states and that's how we think about it however suzuki sales have dropped off and you know anecdotally you talk about this you know from from data that that has been presented from the the different manufacturers you know and from financial reports from ktm ktm was once a, a niche brand in the united states and now its sales outrank that of Suzuki. And I think oftentimes we see it even in the listeners that write in where they say, oh, well, you know, I can't trust a KTM product or I can't trust a Ducati product because it's, you know, it's, it's too niche, you know, those, those Italians or those Austrians. But <laughs> we now have manufacturers that were once considered niche brands in America outselling the giant that once was one of the big four. And you yourself, Lance, said that Suzuki is not one of the big four anymore. You know, it's now the big three as it relates to the American market per se. So what, what a is, bombshell to drop, Spurge. What do we think we're going to see in 10 years? And this is, this is, this goes back to every year, Zach, Lance, myself, the rest of the common tread crew like to write predictions and God help us all. High side, low side is still broadcasting five years from now. What a treat that would be for my pocketbook and your ear holes. Um, but what do we think? If we look back five years from now, we, we come back, we have a reunion. Suzuki still around in the American market? If so, what are they doing? Lance, guest honors. Uh, that's uh, some honor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for, for first option, first opportunity to be wrong. Uh, wonderful. Uh, I, I mean, I, my, my guess would be that what we're going to see is, a, is, is pretty much a continuation of what we've been saying, which is they're not going to invest a lot of R&D money in new models for this market. If we take them at their word and they actually do uh, start moving into 
you know, other, other fuels or other types of drivetrains. Uh, I still think that's going to be predominantly aimed more at other markets around the world than at us. So I, I think we'll continue to see more of what we've seen for the last 20 years, which is they've got an existing structure here. They've got existing models. They can keep selling them and keep making money. They don't need to invest a lot to try to expand because the U.S. motorcycle market isn't expanding. It's not like it's a juicy target. So, juicy. It's it. You know, sales here aren't growing, and there's tremendous amount of competition, as you just pointed out, Spurgeon. You know, when I was when I was starting out in motorcycling, there was nineteen nineteen, you know, <laughs> the year were, at the end of the Great War. We didn't there, know a second war was coming. It was a little later than that, but uh, you know there was Harley <laughs> Davidson and and the four Japanese motorcycle manufacturers, and that was pretty much you know that was mostly it. But look at how much more competition there is in the U.S. market today. You know, look at the strength of Ducati, which was negligible back then. Look at Triumph, which was going out of business back then. You know, look at KTM, which was non-existent in the U.S. Existed, market yeah, back yeah. then. Yeah. So there's so much more competition. And there aren't many more consumers here. So therefore, it's not uh, a market that I think they would really target. So I don't think we're going to see a lot, of, a, a lot of change. Zachary? I don't know. <laughs> I, I think... You mean well, I could have just well said well I don't spoken. know and be done? I, I could have done that? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Zach, no. Zach's a co-host. You, you have oh. to respond. Yeah, yeah, you have to respond. I can just say, duh, beat me, boss. Um, <laughs> I think... It's. I'm gonna. I'm gonna make a. I'm gonna make a very bold prediction, which is that to Lance's point, there's someone in the board. The, you know, the board of directors think, sitting around and they're they're pointing their um, monetary uh, or, or you know revenue arrows at the the things that seem like they are most likely to succeed. And for Suzuki, it's gonna be it's gonna be um, focusing on things that use less fuel or different fuel. And Suzuki as a company, it will just hope that uh, that the that the U.S. market comes around to the rest of the world, <laughs> um, and and you know with, with more and more people moving to to urban areas and population centers becoming dense, that uh, single track two wheel mobility will be um, something that that booms in in North America later, and Suzuki just. You know, if that if that ship comes in, great. If not, Suzuki will keep selling uh, s smaller um, and uh, and more appropriate vehicles to other places in the world. And we and we we may say, remember when Suzuki was a big deal? Remember remember back then? Suzuki used to make motorcycles, and your kids or grandkids will say, "What? They made like real motorcycles, like but like big ones, like ones we see." on the on the road now that they made those ones so yeah yeah not just not just scooters not just little electric vehicles and stuff real real motorcycles you know it's it's interesting i'm i'm woefully ignorant on what's going on in the car world but uh just as sort of by accident and looking at some of this stuff uh, <laughs> suzuki's actually doing some interesting things in other markets around the world and yeah, alternative yeah. fuels with cars and micro right. cars and, and they're, they're actually doing some interesting stuff in the car world and, and it kind of makes sense because, like I said before, they make 12.6 times as much money selling cars as they do motorcycles. So why wouldn't they put their their, their engineering minds and their talent and their money and their R&D budget and all that into into that area? Why not? It seems like why? that's what they're doing. Why so, not? I you heard it here first, everybody. That's that's my. So I'm going to go the opposite of, of the two of you. And I, I mean, keep in mind that Suzuki was the one that not invented but revolutionized two-stroke engines in racing right like they 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 took what was this technology smuggled out of the iron curtain and they they adapted it and they they turned it into uh, a, a winning form of motorcycle racing and everybody followed them and then all of a sudden it, it was they they released revolutionary game-changing motorcycles for the past 50, 60, 70 years, 50, 70 years might be much. No, let's say, let's say, let's 50, say 50, 50, 50 or 60, 50 or yeah. 60. And they were a leader on a global scale, not just a new U.S. scale. And I want to believe that what we are going to see from Suzuki is a refocusing of their efforts. I think that in my eternal optimism, 
eternal optimism um, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play devil's advocate and that five years from now, when we reconvene and we're all a little <laughs> bit older and wiser. For the next episode. Yeah. Um, that <laughs> Suzuki is going to have something that's going to be really impressive that we're really excited about that is a, a leader in the pack. I, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic that they're going to go back and they're going to revolutionize whether that's hybrid or EV or, or, or something that, that works uh, on a new scale and, and it takes us into a new era of, you know, what's important for two wheels. And I... So, 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 so Suzuki is taking a step back now in order to, uh, in order to, to deliver an uppercut to the motorcycle market in three to five years. That's what I'm going to go on the record saying. All right. And because <laughs> like there's no real risk or penalty for me being wrong, hell, why not? <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I, I, to your point, Spurge, I think we covered a lot of interesting topics on, on Suzuki today and, uh, and the rest of the motorcycling world. I hope that everyone got a kick out of it. Lance, we appreciate your insights as always. I would like to play the engine rev sound game. Because at this regardless point. of what Suzuki does five years from now, engines are what's relevant now and it's what gets our motors running. So Lance, <laughs> we're going to introduce you to a new little game that we like to play here on High Side, Low Side. This is a game that came from the wild insides of Zach's mind. And we are going to play an engine sound for you. We're all going to play along. Zach and I don't know what the engine sound is. Um, I got my fingers crossed that it's a Suzuki, though. Wouldn't if, that be poetic? If uh, if we have no guesses or we're not sure in a direction, I do have I have a, a piece of paper that says two hints and an answer. Um, <laughs> I will set that aside. If I need to open up to the hints, I will, but that is set aside for the time being. Lance, do you have any questions before we get started or any comments that you'd like to contribute to the audience? So so we're going to listen to an engine and then allegedly identify it? Well, you you are, and then Zach and I are going to play <laughs> against you. So we're all going to take our turn guessing. No. Yeah, that is no, correct. No, no, no. We're not playing it. We're all playing it. We're all paddling the same direction here, Lance. Don't let him get too competitive with you. All, the, all three of us are going to listen to a sound we've not heard before, and we're going to try to guess the make and model of the bike. Well, can I just go on the record as saying that I hate this game already? Oh, no, you can't. How dare you? Why would you say that? Right to my because face. He, he told you it was my idea. I know, but it, I, I didn't say I hate it because it's your idea. I hate it because I'm going <laughs> to suck at it. I'd ah. like to think that the implication was that he hated it because it was your idea. No, <laughs> no. I, I'm, I'm going to be terrible at this. I mean, to be clear, Lance, I am also bad at it. So it's fine to be bad at it. Oh, well, you know, that's who, good. You know who's really good at it? Patrick Garvin. <laughs> I'm yeah, well, sure. Yeah, we, I would we expect teed him up in a way that was, that, yeah. that was a little bit... You know, whatever. no. I mean, when, when I when I if, when I experience a motorcycle, you know, first is of the five senses. There's, I like the, how it feels is very important. Uh, how it works, you know, that's feel, and how it looks is next important. I mean, okay, sound is somewhere down there at the bottom of the list, right above taste, because I don't lick my motorcycle, <laughs> so I don't really care. Don't really care how they taste, but I don't pay that much attention to the sound. Okay. I can understand. I can understand look and feel. But, but taste and smell, yeah, I taste, don't buy. So well, it, at the very least, it's third on the list. You know, all it sound. takes is one. All it takes is one drop of leaking oil falling on a hot exhaust, and smell jumps right up above uh, sound. You know, that's no. Get out of here. <laughs> no. Get come out. on. I, I, I'm just telling you all what right. I noticed. You know, I'm let's say it. Let's not. Uh, let's not leave any further adieus. Let's olfactory, listen to this engine sound. Ol- olfactory uh. senses aside. <laughs> uh, okay, we're all going to listen to this sound. And so are you, the audience. You can play along. Shout it out if you know it in your car or your cubicle or wherever you are. Lance, are you done listening? Yeah, I'm done. (laughs) In more ways than one. Cooked, finished. Parallel twin? (laughs) No, it's not parallel twin. You don't think so? 
No. No, no, no. It's got it's got four cylinders or more, perhaps. What? Really? Yeah. Yeah, you think it's a parallel twin? There's no way. Hang on. I'm gonna I mean, I, I, like I said, I've been so bad at this already. Lance, what do you think? What are you hearing? Sometimes, um, Aerie made, Aerie made a good, sorry to interrupt you already. Aerie made a good point, which is sometimes the starter motor can be a giveaway. You know, you like, you hear the starter motor and you're like, oh, I recognize that. But there's a that, wine there too, right? Like there's a wine. There's a wine. There's a wine. Sounds like a water pump wine to me. The, the revs is, oh, I thought I had it right away when it started, but then the revs, the revs are getting me a little bit. I'm listening again. All right. Well, what do you, what do you think, Lance? What are you hearing? Any what, what's what's you 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 engine think, t- engine type? What engine type do we think we're working with, Lance? It's, it's in line, right? It's not a parallel twin. It's got to be four cylinders or more, Spurge. I okay. think it's got to be. Okay. Is that what you're hearing too, Lance? I'm gonna say it's a 1934 Crocker single, and the Stop exhaust it. valve is a little Stop loose. Stop it! Stop <laughs> it! You're not a savant. Uh, How dare you? <laughs> Also, if that engine's from 1934, <laughs> it's been hiding somewhere. Uh, all right, let's, we got to make some guesses here. Do we want to hint before we make any guesses? I don't want to hint. I'm going to make a guess before I get a hint. All right. BMW K1600 inline six cylinder engine. Wow. Lance is shaking his head no for those of you listening. That, that no means I have no clue. Um, all, right. No. <laughs> all right, so the first hint. The first What's the first hint, hint Spurge? Oh, the sound was sourced from Quaker City Motorsports here in Philadelphia. They sell BMW, okay, Triumph, Ducati, and Royal Enfield. So it could be a BMW. So it is not a Ducati or a Royal Enfield. I I feel pretty confident. I don't think. Is, I don't is, think, is, is, is I don't come think, along with me there? <laughs> I don't think it sounds like a Ducati or a Royal Enfield. I think it could be a Triumph. Yeah, I kind of thought it might be a Triumph. Really? Uh, okay. I, I think what? it's a Triumph at this point. I'm now, just, I'm hearing that, that, I'm hearing that little wobble, 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 wobble in the idle. But that's a that's Triumph, a, man. That's a Triumph wine. Yeah, that wine like, is a little triumphy. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> that wine. Yeah, the water pump wine is very triumphy. But do you think that our producer Chase would give us two triples in a row? That oh, seems good like point. Do you that think does that seem unlikely? I'm yeah. sticking with BMW K1600. I. I <laughs> I think it's a triumph, man. I, you think it's I a triumph? Wanna, okay, I, what, this what goes triumph back then? My, Is it a big triple my, then? It's a, no, it it's, goes back to my parallel twin comment. I don't, I think it's a parallel twin. Like, I I want to say it's you, a triumph parallel twin. I, what? Yeah, a I, Bonneville I, or something? You're nuts. I think maybe. Lance, anything from you? Anything at all? I'm going to say it's the triumph speed triple. A speed triple. Yeah. Okay. So that's the so big... I would say it's the street triple, but it sounded a little... I don't know. For some reason, it sounded to me like it was bigger than street triple. I mean, okay. it could no. be the 765. It could no. be, but I'm not sure. Because I'm thinking... Because remember, the, the Tiger the Tiger 900 is, <laughs> and the 1200 are now using that cross-plane or the T-plane crank thing, so it doesn't sound like that. It sounds more historical to me. But now I'm thinking maybe our producer, Chase, got a used bike, and this is an older model and not a new one. <laughs> yeah, who knows? If it's a used model, I'm gonna listen, it's I'm gonna a listen used one more BMW... Time. K bike, what's the next hint? It's a it's a Triumph triple. Lance is right. <laughs> Honestly, okay. it's a Triumph us, triple. All right. all right. So the the, the final hint is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Spurgeon just used a very bad word, and we apologize to your younger <laughs> listeners. But I assume that means I'm right. Straight six engine. Straight oh. six BMW K sixteen hundred. I'm telling you that uh, I heard a little bit of the starter motor that I recognized, and then that the the way that it idles that like uh, kind of slightly lumpy. It's like it's a buttery smooth engine that engine, but it's got that uh, the thing in the fuel injection or the idle. I don't know, but it goes yeah, did 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 kind of. I'm gonna make a point that Zach picked this before we gave out the first hint, right? So the answer, Zach. You know, when we first, does, when we, Lance, for your edification, when we first started talking about doing this game, Lance, uh, or Zach rather, was very excited about it. And I had a conversation with our producer, Spencer, uh, who, who's been on the podcast a couple of times, and he produces some of the video content here. And he's like, man, he's like, you have to understand, Zach is really good at engine sound. He's playing, <laughs> he wants to play this game with you guys to like show off his, 
one <coughs> unique talent. And the answer for today's game, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, for those of you playing along at home, <laughs> the engine sound you have just listened to is a 2013 BMW K1600 GT. And we want to say special thank you to Mike over at Quaker City Motorsports for helping us play this game. Man, Thanks. oh man. That's, that's impressive. impressive. Thanks That's for impressive. teaming me up, Mike. I appreciate it. I will say, this is the third time we played this game, and and I thought it was like a 50s Harley the first time. It wasn't. I thought it was, what did I think it was? Oh, I thought it was a Kawasaki Parallel Twin the second time. Not even close. So I'm I'm basically one for three. I'm, I, I, uh, I'll take your your congratulations, and I, I'm, I am proud of myself. I, I won't lie. But it's not like I've been cleaning house around here, you know? Well... With that being said, <laughs> Lance, I want to thank you for joining us in the conversation today. I want to thank you for sharing all of your deep-seated Suzuki knowledge with those of you listening. Every yeah. Everyone that has Indeed. listened to this episode is in a debt of gratitude to you, mm. not just for <laughs> listening to you talk about it, but also you know, for reading your articles and all the in-depth work you've done on Common Tread. For those of you that want more information about Suzuki, go check out all of Lance Oliver's articles on Common Tread, and mostly... You know, for the competition you've provided for young Zachary here, thank you for joining us in the high side, low side engine listening game. The world thanks you. All right, guys. Hasta luego, mis Hasta amigos. Hasta luego. See you, man. See you. Okie dokie, everybody. Silver Fox Lance Oliver himself. He's in, he's out. He's dropping knowledge left and right. Handsome um, as the day is long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, lots of good uh, knowledge in general inside that um, that head of his, not just Suzuki knowledge. So if you don't keep up with the Common Tread blog, please do. He works hard on it. Uh, the rest of us don't work as hard, but we do work hard on it as well. So um, there's uh, those stories that we referenced are, are um, good little pods of information for all the stuff we talked about. On to giving away a T-shirt, Spurgeon Dunbar. What do we got this time around? Well, I just want to say first and foremost, uh, remember the engine game, the engine right. sound game is uh, something that you can participate in as well. Send in your engine sounds. You don't have to do anything fancy. You can do it on your cell phone. Make sure, like Mike did from Quaker City Motorsports, that you get a, an idling sound, a few good revs, an idling sound, and it, it should be at least you know 30 seconds long so our producer, Chase, can you know deem what's important there. Startup, a little bit of idling, few revs. Shut off. Pretty yeah. basic. There you Pretty go. Basic. And you can be like Mike, and you can win yourself a high side, low side T-shirt. That way, uh, Mike will be getting a fancy new T-shirt in the mail. Uh, all he has to do is shoot us an email to highsidelowsideatrevzilla.com, and he can claim his T-shirt, much like <laughs> the upcoming Apple Podcast Review winner, D Pelt seventy three. We yeah. ask that all of you out there send in your reviews to apple podcasts subscribe listen and watch but it does help when you leave us a review so yes. d pelt 73 is our winner for this do you want to say d something to d pelt well, I, was, I was gonna i was gonna pick it up and read is it okay if oh. i read the oh yes by all story? means d pelt, oh, yeah. d pelt go for, for it d pelt 73 is winning a t-shirt for very creative use of an apple podcast review d pelt told a story which i will now read to you um and hopefully you're as entertained as we were d pelt says I was grocery shopping at my local grocery store, good place to grocery shop, by the way, wearing my high side, low side t-shirt when another shopper came up to me and said, quote, hey, you listen to them? We ended up hitting it off and walked out to the parking lot. He ended up having his Multistrada parked next to my K1600 GTL. We admired each other's motorcycles and, and have been best friends ever since. Love to hear it. You love to hear it. The final line of Deep Pelt 73's review is, and then I woke up. No K1600 GTL, no friend, and no high side, low side t-shirt. Very sad indeed, but you could change one of those things. And this was just a, this was a left hook. We, this, this, it, it took a sharp left turn at the end of the story. Um, and we, we so appreciate your creativity, Deep Pelt, so much so that we're going to send you a high side, low side t-shirt. Yeah, we're not going to be friends with you, for God's sake. No, and uh, goodness, we're not no. sending you a BMW uh, uh, K1600 GTL, but we can give you a t-shirt and we appreciate you leaving us the review. <laughs> Absolutely. So send your preferred t-shirt size and your mailing address to highsidelowside at revzilla.com. And, uh, and thank you again for giving us a chuckle as we looked through those podcast reviews. And of course, I am just kidding, Deep Health. We can give you two things. We can be your friend. <laughs> uh, I like to think of all of our listeners as our friends. And I like to think of Zach 
as a friend as well. I don't think he views me in the same light, but, but you know, that's just I'm because you don't have trying. any actual friends. Exactly. Exactly. Right. I'm going to keep trying, though. One of these days, I'm going to win you over. Let's move All on right. to the high side, low side comments. <laughs> and we've got a few for the day. First comment came in from Casey, who sent us an email and said, I've been riding for a couple of years, but outside of changing oil, cleaning my chain, I don't really feel comfortable tinkering with my 2019 BMW F850 GS just yet. Nice bike, Casey. Give you a little shout out there. He says, or she says, Casey could be a boy or a girl. True. I am looking for uh, bike suggestions to get my hands dirty with some motor wrenching, something I could spend the winter rebuilding. Are there certain engine types that would be good for me to learn on? Any specific bikes that would be good to be on the lookout for? Ideally, I'm looking for something less than $3,000. Zachary. Mm. Well, I'm going to, I'll kick it off. I'm going to say an air-cooled single cylinder engine probably in a little dirt bike that's you took my... my answer and for those of you listening zach and i didn't talk about this ahead of time <laughs> no we didn't um i was looking at casey's we don't talk because we're not friends yeah i know it breaks my heart um <laughs> i was looking at casey's uh 2019 bmw f850 gs and i'm thinking this individual likes to ride adventure bikes uh -huh. they probably enjoy getting out and riding something a little bit dirtier than an uh -huh. adventure bike and why not get a little used dr 200 250 <laughs> something that they could you know turn around and maybe rebuild and learn how to put you know a, a, a new battery in or a, you right. know maybe rebuild the forks or right. cut a chain off and put a new chain on oh, yeah so much you could do yeah exactly so um to expand on the, that suggestion a little bit, if a little dirt bike, we say little dirt bike, you could get a TTR 125, you know, like a basically a kid's bike if you want to sort of take it to a local OHV park or a parking lot and learn how to do wheelies and slide around and, um, you know, sort of train on a tiny little motorcycle. If that's what you want to do, that's not a bad idea. And those bikes are fairly easy to work on uh, anything in that in that realm, like a little uh, um, little Japanese dirt bike with an air-cooled single-cylinder engine. Uh, or you could take it to the other end of the spectrum. You could get a, a, a Honda XR650, right? Uh, you know, the, a full-size dirt bike or a Suzuki DR650. Um, and uh, you'd have an air-cooled single, but you'd also have a bike you could trot down, the, trot down the highway for a few exits and use it as an off-road training tool. You could use it. It would be a smaller version of your, of your uh, BMW adventure bike in some ways. But it'd be easy to work on, and it would be, you know, for less than 3000 bucks, it's going to be kind of clapped out and... Um, you know, you're going to want to put new tires on it and, and, uh, and fiddle with some stuff like that. But I think that, I think that's a, a reasonable thing to suggest. And Casey, I'm going to point you in the direction of an article I wrote years ago. Uh, and there was an accompanying video with it, but it was called the terrifically fun tale of the thousand dollar adventure bike. And <laughs> it, it, uh, is a, an article I wrote about buying a Suzuki DR Z 250 and basically taking it out and doing a bunch of crazy uh, dual sports and adventure rides and things with it. And at the time, that bike was roughly $1,000. Now, I think with the way the market is, you'd probably be getting closer to two to $3,000 for a bike like that. But there was no shortage of opportunities uh, to learn how to fix that bike up. Um, and, I, and I think, like Zach was talking about and alluding to, it would be a great opportunity for you without a lot of complexity. So check out mm -hmm. the terrifically fun tale of the $1,000 adventure bike if you want a little <laughs> bit of inspiration. Indeed. Okay, next uh, email we got was from Christopher. This is just a quick uh, quick um, read here. Christopher turned 60, uh, haven't owned a bike in 10 years. Wife gave him permission uh, to buy a new motorcycle. Christopher's question is CF Moto centric. If you're not familiar with CF Moto, it's a Chinese company uh, that has started importing bikes more and more to the United States. Um, they Brandon, have a Brandon bunch Wise of, just wrote a nice little uh, article on Common Tread of all the different models. True. Yes. Um, yeah. Something to do with CF Moto's uh, American lineup or something like that is what the article is called. Um, basically, Christopher said, "When are you going to review or do a quote daily ride on a CF Moto?" And I just wanted to uh, very specifically call out Christopher and say that there is a daily rider on a CF Moto live on Revzilla's YouTube channel as we talk at you and this podcast there you it go it was the 650 adventura model was um, it was it christopher's email that pushed you over the edge zach to be able to go out and create a daily rider episode on that <laughs> not really don't uh, lie have, don't lie give christopher we, the credit he no uh christopher is important in my creative <laughs> process as we all know but um 
Uh, but no, we've, we get a lot of questions about CF Motos, and uh, we're excited to try the bike. So uh, check that out if you are interested. You can check it out. Uh, there's articles on Common Tread, and of course, there is the Daily Rider program, which Zach stars in, and the mm. final high side, low side comment of season six, episode three, comes from John. J O N, not J O H N. Uh, John sent us an email and says, started riding in 1970, and I rode until I was married with three daughters in my house. 15-year pause. I then purchased a DRZ400, geared it down for better off-road abilities, and I love it. I do. I love it. But at the same time, I miss being able to jump on a bike and ride to a destination a couple hundred miles away. He misses those longer highway jaunts. I'm looking to replace my ride. Uh, the ADV, uh, ADV Fest made it clear to me what I really enjoy doing, and that is the uh, the easy route that John rode on Saturday. John, uh, unfortunately, did not tell us whether he was at Get On Adventure Fest in Mojave or uh, South Dakota. Are you saying he did or didn't? You? Oh, I'm sorry. I was wrong. Producer Chase just cut that out of here. He was in South Dakota. So uh, <laughs> not not deep sand, easy ride, maybe a little bit of gravel. With some, with some hard pack thrown in, and then some street as well. Uh, it says, my old-fashioned heart really wants a Bonneville T120 with appropriate tires. I believe that the Triumph would be spot on for that type of riding with 80% of my time being on the road. Uh, I think he's referring to me when he says, with your Bonneville experience, do you think it's suitable for ADB Fest easy routes? So Well, Spurge, you're the guy with the Bonneville experience. You tell him. Here's what I'm here's what I'm thinking, John. If it was me and I already had a Bonneville in the garage, which I do, uh, <laughs> I would I would you know throw a set of knobbier tires on there, and I think it would be perfectly appropriate for the easy route, um, especially with a set of higher handlebars. However, John, you don't already own a Bonneville. You're not like me, uh, but you want to be, which I can understand. <laughs> Most people do have those goals and aspirations in their daily life. So what I would say to you is that Triumph has a better bike in their lineup for this, and it's the Scrambler. Now, maybe you don't want to spend the money on the Scrambler 1200. You should. It's a beautiful machine. They have an XE and an XC. That is the less extreme version. Or you could just go with the, uh, it was called the Street Scrambler 900. It's now just back to being called the Scrambler 900. And frankly, I think either one of those bikes would be better for you because of the the changes and the adjustments that Triumph has made to make it a little bit more fun and a little bit more capable off road and I think the beauty there is that you still get all the aesthetics that you're looking for um, from Triumph but you get something that is a little bit you know more geared to what you want to be doing which is the occasional fire road or gravel road or dirt road and I think that Triumph has the perfect bike for you it's just not a T120 Zach any thoughts agree disagree no notes book it. Get there yourself a scrambler, John. That's what you need. And be uh, like me, but just well, with a different version that, of Triumph. Okay, I'll disagree with that. <laughs> you don't need to try to be like Spurgeon. But <laughs> if you want to ride a classic-looking Triumph off-road about 20% of the time, then for the love of Pete, get yourself a scrambler. And we actually took turns riding. We had, we had one of the Scrambler 1200 XEs at Get On Adventure Fest uh, Mojave, and we rode the bejesus out of that thing <laughs> so it really does it does hold up if you want to go a little bit harder than the easy route as well so agreed yeah it's a it's a it's a big burly machine but it's pretty capable pretty fun all right that's it for episode three of season six of high side low side everybody thanks to um casey thanks to christopher thanks to john and of course thanks to dpelt 73 you're the winner of the t-shirt this time around please send um, your information to highside, lowside at revzilla.com. If you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment below. Um, and of course, send us your engine sounds. Um, be like Mike. Up. Be like Mike. Be like, be like Mike. Send us, uh, send us your engine sound with the year, make, model, and uh, any modifications you have to your motorcycle. If we feature it, we will send you a t shirt. And when I say we, I of course mean producer Chase. Absolutely. So <laughs> I actually got an Instagram message from a gentleman uh, the other day. And he said, I haven't gotten my T-shirt yet. I just, I feel so bad. And I and went so to Producer Chase. 20 lashings I, for Chase. I, oh, he will not forget <laughs> to send a T-shirt again, I'll tell you that much. 
I mean, we can't have him on camera right now because the bruises haven't healed, and that's an HR violation if I've ever seen one. But we like to, for those of you new, uh, getting back on topic here, uh, to High Side, Low Side Season 6, we like to round things out at the end. We like to give a, a, a synopsis, a brief summary of what you've learned here with the hopes that you, you take it with you. So, Zach, what have you learned today? Anything, anything new for you? My big takeaway for episode three, season six of High Side, Low Side is let's remember to think outside the sphere of what we normally do in the world of motorcycling, right? It's so easy to think that what you do is the most important piece because that's the news you follow. That's the people you're interested. All that stuff is what we find ourselves drawn to, right? I'm a big MotoGP fan, so it's easier for me to get this myopic, uh, you know, kind of... uh, uh, blinded view of what's important in the world of motorcycles because I watch MotoGP and I think, oh, that's all that matters. But Lance makes a darn good point. There's lots of other stuff going on. And Suzuki is a successful company outside of what we normally see here in the United States and what we often talk about on high side, low side. So so just remember that. Remember to think. Think outside uh, uh, what's going on and, and, uh, and subvert your own expectations and look for stories somewhere else. And, um, and uh, maybe maybe the story you've been hearing or reading isn't the whole story. So if I'm if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that high side low side is the most important thing in motorcycling because we are looking beyond the box of our own personal purviews. So in a I'm, way, I'm, if you listen to high side low side, you are paying attention to the most important thing in motorcycling, which is you and I, Zach. Is that what you're trying to get at? Well. I think what I meant more was that Lance Oliver is the messiah of motorcycling information, and we should all pray at his altar every, every day. And on but yeah, that what you note, said is, you know. Yeah. Hopefully, we have entertained you. If not educated, hopefully, we have entertained you, which is really our ultimate goal here at the High Side, Low Side podcast. And with that, we have got nothing left in the tank for you today, but we do ask <laughs> that you subscribe to High Side, Low Side, wherever you get your podcasts so that you can keep up with episode four as soon as it hits the airwaves, probably within two weeks of you listening to this one. So for now, I'm going to go ahead and on behalf of Zachary and myself, I'm going to bid you adieu and uh, I'm going to ask you to enjoy the ride. See you, everybody.